um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into our topic for today. Today we're learning about the history of the Audubon Society, as well as some um, backyard bird information. Um, please help me welcome Linda Stusher. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, my name is Linda Stusher. My husband, Carl, and I are the owners of Wild Birds Unlimited. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Wild Birds Unlimited in Rochester Hills at Walton and Adams. Um, we've been backyard naturalists for over 20 years. We started the feeding the birds when we first moved here in 1991, and now we are happy to say that our hobby has grown into our business. It's like going to work and having fun with your best friends. So thank you for inviting me here today to uh, talk about the origins of the Audubon Society. I'd like to title today's talk, She's Wearing a Dead Bird on Her Head. Of course, they didn't quite look like this, so, but I, don't, I didn't have a dead bird. So, um, The National Audubon Society is an American nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to conservation. Audubon is one of the oldest such organizations in the world, established in 1905. Audubon's mission is to conserve and restore natural ecosystems, focusing on birds, wildlife, and their habitats for the benefit of us and the Earth's biological diversity. It is named in honor of John James Audubon, a Franco-American ornithologist and naturalist who painted, cataloged, and described the birds of North America in his famous book, Birds of America, published in sections between 1827 and 1838. The book was printed on handmade paper measuring 39 and a half inches tall and 28 and a half inches wide so that he could portray birds life size. So some of the larger birds, they, you need that paper. So that's a pretty uh, awesome collection of birds. Um, birds in the US were threatened by hunting for sport as well as for fashion. For hundreds of years, people would wear a single plume on their hats. The feather in the hat design can be traced back to such fashion conscious notables as the Pied Piper and Yankee Doodle. Then somewhere around the 19th century, it all went wrong. Rich women decided if one feather was cool, wearing the entire bird would make them downright happening. In the fashion literature of the time, bird feathers were promoted as realistic, rare, and natural. The more rare a bird, the more valuable were its feathers, therefore giving the wearer a greater social standing. And during the height of this fashion trend, whole birds were stuffed and mounted on hats. So instead of just a feather or two, sometimes the entire bird was sewn on a hat. Things were so bad that in 1886, Frank Chapman, an avid birder, hiked up from his uptown Manhattan office to the heart of the Women's Fashion District on 14th Street, which, by the way, is over 60 blocks. He tallied the stuffed birds on hats of passing women. He identified wings, heads, tails, and entire bodies of three bluebirds, two red-headed woodpeckers, nine Baltimore Orioles, five blue jay, 21 common terns, a saw wet owl, and a prairie hen. In two afternoons, he counted 174 birds and 40 species in all. Ten years later, a Boston socialite named Harriet Hemingway decided enough was enough. She called her cousin Mina, and together they organized a series of afternoon teas. During these teas, it was suggested to the other socialite women of Boston that birds could better be enjoyed by sitting in their trees, rather than on the hats of the rich, and were urged to boycott bird hats. The other ladies agreed, thus began the Massachusetts Audubon Society, the country's oldest Audubon Society. Harry and Mina were not the minimalist earth tree huggers of today, they were part of Boston's upper crust. However, upper crust or not, they were still women, and in 1896, women were anything but a powerful source. They could not vote, and most were not allowed to have a meaningful job. These women may not have much power, but their husbands were tremendously powerful. With their help, the word was spread that the fashion industry was needlessly destroying our native bird population. Within months, other societies sprang up in other states voicing the same concerns. In Washington, during one week in spring of 1897, nature author Florence Merriam claimed to have seen 2,600 dead robins for sale in one market stall in Washington alone. 
In the late 1880s, the American Ornithologist Union estimated that five million birds were killed annually for the fashion market. They also, not only did they have hats, they had birds on their fans, bird feathers and things, not whole birds, but feathers. Um, public opinion soon turned on the fashion industry. In 1900, four years after Harriet and Minas started their afternoon teas, the Lacey Act was passed. The Lacey Act banned the transportation of illegally killed birds across state lines. This was the first in the string of victories for the preservation of birds. The most powerful of all victories was the Migratory Bird Act of 1918, which is still in effect today. The statute makes it unlawful to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, or sell birds. And the statute does not discriminate between dead and live birds. It also grants full protection to any bird parts, including feathers, eggs, and nests. Over 800 species are currently on the list. That act clearly saved many familiar birds from extinction. Stopping the slaughter of birds might not, might not seem like a no-brainer today, but in 1896, shooting stuff was a way of life for many people. Killing birds for the millinery trade was a very profitable business. The Bird Protection Act puts, put thousands of people out of work. With this one cause, Harriet and Mina were not only at the forefront of the con conservation movement, they also made a statement for the fledging women's movement. If turn-of-the-century women wanted to be taken seriously by their male counterparts, they could no longer walk around with entire birds on their head. One of Audubon's many campaigns is the Christmas bird count. Prior to the turn of the century, people engaged in a holiday tradition known as the Christmas side hunt. They would choose sides and go afield with their guns, and whoever brought in the biggest pile of feathered and furred quarry would win. Remember, conservation was in its beginning stages around that time, and many observers and scientists were becoming concerned about the declining bird population. Beginning on Christmas Day 1900, ornithologist Frank Chapman, who I spoke about earlier, he was an early officer in the then, then budding Audubon Society, proposed a new holiday tradition, a Christmas bird census, that would count birds in the holidays instead of hunting them. So began the Christmas bird count. Thanks to the inspiration of Frank Chapman and the enthusiasm of 27 dedicated birders, 25 Christmas bird counts were held that first year. Last year, in 2012, there were over 2,300 Christmas bird counts submitted. The 114th annual Audubon Christmas bird count will take place this December 14th to January 5th, and actually Oakland County will be assigned one of those days. If anybody wants to join up, they can go to the um, Oakland uh, Audubon webpage. Um, this is the longest running citizen science survey in the world. Christmas bird counts provide critical data on population trends. And tens of thousands of people participating in it just love it. Um, well, thanks to the likes of Harriet, Mina, and many others through the years, we can enjoy watching our native birds. The hobby of bird watching and feeding is the second largest hobby in the US, right behind gardening. The term bird watching appeared for the first time as a title of a book, Bird Watching, by Edmund Celius in 1901. In North America, the identification of birds, once thought possible only by shooting, was made possible by the emergence of optics and field guides. The earliest field guide in the US was Birds Through an Opera Glass by Florence Bailey. Today, there are many field guides available. I just have three of them here, and there are probably over 100 field guides that you can get. Even though you can't wear a bird on your hat today, and who would want to, although somebody does have a bird hat. Yes, yeah. Where did you get that bird hat, do you know? Actually, I bought it at a sale. You bought it at a sale? I bought it at a sale, and the young lady, she said it belonged to her grandmother's something or other. Oh, wow. And she said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I might at some time have to change the wearer, or whatever purpose it is, show or tell. Right. Yeah, oh. <laughs> a real bird hat. Wow, that's pretty cool. Really?
Wow. Yeah, I, w I wish you would have brought it today. That would have been pretty cool. No, I wouldn't have. <laughs> this was long before people knew what they were doing, you know? <laughs> so, um, we can still enjoy our birds today. Birds offer us our best chance at observing wild creatures right in our own backyards. Um, birds are all around us, and unless you have your head in a hole, you're going to see one every day. Um, and those who enjoy a touch of wildness birds can bring to their lives um, will often try to attack, attract them to their own backyard. Does anybody here feed the birds now? Oh, quite a few of you. OK, great. Yeah, um, I think at last count, I had 25 bird feeders in my yard. So, yeah, so it takes an hour to feed them all, so it's, uh, it's a joy. So attracting birds to your yard is really quite simple, or even a patio if you have a condo. Um, you just supply their three basic needs, food, water, and shelter. Do that, and you will have a refuge in your own backyard. Let's talk about those three needs. Um, it's especially important to feed birds in the winter when food is in short supply. In fact, the Cornell Department of Ornithology did a study in Wisconsin during the winter that showed two-thirds of the chickadee population would have perished during winter, like we had two years ago, if we, if we hadn't had bird feeders out for them. So in the summer, um, so that in the birds in the winter get 75% of their diet from our bird feeders, and in the summer it's just the opposite. They get 25% of um, their diet from our bird feeders. Um, some people decide not to feed the birds in the summer because there's plenty full of food around. Um, however, I feed all year round just because I like to see them. I like to see them raise their babies, bring their babies back to the feeder in the summer. So it's, it's uh, all fun. So another thing, um, seed types. Uh, most of your birds that come to your feeder like black oil sunflower seeds, like cardinals, chickadees, house finches, nuthatches, Black oil sunflower, um, ounce for ounce, can, contains as much protein as ground beef. Ground feeding birds like sparrows, morning doves, and in the winter, the, um, black eye, uh, the dark eyed junco, will, they love millet because they eat all over the ground. Um, this is one type of seed feeder. It has a larger hole here. Um, we have many types. There's hopper feeders, there's uh, tray feeders. A bird like a cardinal would not like to perch on this feeder because he has super big feet for a bird, and he also likes to eat facing his food. So at something like that, I would put a tray on this feeder so he could stand up and eat while he was eating there. The squirrels like love bird seed. There is a seed called safflower. Um, it's a white seed, it's very bitter. The squirrels tend to leave it alone. I'm not gonna say they'll never eat it, but they tend to leave it alone. It, um, the birds don't care about the taste. Um, or anything. Um, we also have a suet that contains hot pepper. The birds don't. Uh, the birds don't care about the hot pepper. The squirrels don't like that taste. So, so that's. And we. There are squirrel-proof feeders out there. There's many types of squirrel-proof feeders that really do work. Um, another feeder uh, would be a thistle feeder, and that would be for the yellow goldfinches. Um, they stay here all year round, by the way, and they are very community eaters. They would. All of these perches would be filled at once. Uh, the goldfinches, like they're not very territorial like other birds. Um, like right now, the males are bright yellow, but pretty soon they're going to change color. They're going to turn to a drab yellow, more like the female bird. And then next spring, when it's time to woo the lady, he will turn bright yellow again. So that's kind of a cool thing to watch. And suet, I was talking about suet, is a high energy, pure fat substance particularly helpful for migrating birds that are coming in in the spring and nesting birds because it has a lot of fat content in it. Um, you'll get birds like woodpeckers, nuthatches, chickadees, titmice. Many birds will come to a suet feeder. Many people don't like to feed suet in the summer because it gets all gooey, but we do have a no-melt suet dough that can go up to 130 degrees and it won't get melty like that. So that works really well. So I feed suet all year long. I find that the baby birds easily can take suet um, easier than a shell food, so um, that's kind of fun. And if you aren't offering your birds, you're truly missing out. Peanuts. 
If you don't offer your birds peanuts, you're truly missing out. Um, you can offer shelled birds for birds like woodpeckers, nuthatches, blue jays. Blue jays especially love in-shell peanuts, like all the way whole in the shell. I've actually seen them pick one up, like feel it in his mouth, drop it, and find another one that had more meat in it. Yeah, I've witnessed that. And another thing they'll do is they'll just come to your feeder, take a peanut, fly away, and he'll cache it, which means he's storing it. Fly back, take another peanut. He will do that until my peanut feeder is empty. Yes, as a matter of fact, they do. Lots of birds will cache food, especially for the upcoming winter time. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, hummingbird feeders and oriole feeders. This is a type of hummingbird feeder. Um, it has a high perch for the bird to land on, so you can easily see him when he lands there. Um, then there's an oriole feeder, and if you feed orioles or hummingbirds, keep them out until the end of September because our hummingbirds will start moving soon to go south. They need a lot of fuel along the way. Then we're going to be getting our birds that are coming from up north, migrating through our backyard. So we want to keep those feeders out till maybe October 1st. Did you have a question? How do you keep the bees out? That's a very difficult thing. It's, it's almost impossible, yeah. Um, certain feeders have bee guards. It'll keep them out of the nectar, but it won't keep them from trying to get in. And they scare the, bird, they scare the hummingbirds away, basically, yeah. And now we do have ant moats that go above a feeder. If you're finding you're getting ants in your hummingbird feeder, in the food, then you, it's a little moat you fill with regular water. The ants get trapped in there. Uh, fruit feeding is another nice thing to do. You can offer oranges for the Orioles, um, dried raisins, cherries, cranberries, uh, preferred by robins. Um, robins don't eat out of our seed feeders, so, but if you want to enjoy them, you could offer them some fruit. Um, Orioles and cardinals. Grosbeaks all love the orange and apple, ha apple halves. Grape jelly, does anybody know who likes grape jelly? The Baltimore Oriole. Just go get some grape jelly, put it in a little bowl, and I'll bet you'll get an Oriole. Really? Yeah. And the time to put out the hummingbird and Oriole feeders is tax day, mid-April. They don't normally come till like May 1st, but you want to be ready for them. Mealworm feeding is another great way to attract non-seed-eating birds. Um, Now's a good time to start. Um, we recommend using live mealworms because they're squiggly. We, some people don't like to deal with worms because you have to keep them in your refrigerator too. <laughs> I should have brought them to show you. You would serve them on a little tray. We have there's certain little trays you could put a little bowl out with them on, but you want to have not not if it's a certain kind. No, they won't. Yeah. And um, seed blends is another option, other than just uh, black oil sunflower seeds. We're, there's all kinds of seed blends out there um, with that offer a variety of seed. All of them will have black oil sunflower in it because that's a staple of all of our birds. But many of them add millet, cracked corn, safflower. Um, so that's, that's a nice, nice way to do it. We also have, if, you, if, you do ha if you're feeding the birds and you're finding shells all, all underneath your feeder, we have a no mess has absolutely no shells on it. So you don't have the mess, you don't have to clean that up because that can get moldy. Um, anything, you know, anything that falls down will get eaten up. Uh, there's natural food sources out there like trees and uh, plants. Trees that produce berries and fruit are really attractive to birds. Um, trees also to have in your yard for shelter. Um, you can also make a brush pile for shelter, especially in the winter when some of the trees are bare. Uh, it's good to have uh, pine trees and um, and shelter for them. An overgrown yard will attract the widest variety of birds. Um, so essentially, the more plants you have, the better for the birds. And then nesting, um, all birds nest in the spring, but not all use nesting boxes or birdhouses. Many build nests in trees and shrubs. But for those that do, um, if you want to put up a birdhouse for the nesting birds, like the wrens, the chickadees, um, bluebirds, you can get a nesting house, but just be have it up um, early spring for them because they start looking for their homes early. I had two wren, two broods of wren in the same house, right one right after another. So that was kind of fun to watch those babies grow up. Um, yes. I heard that for Michigan native birds, you should have birdhouses that don't have a perch. We don't sell any birdhouses that have perches, actually. Um, does that one have a perch? No. No, I was going to say. <laughs> So, 
No, we don't recommend that. That makes it much easier for a predator to grab onto, get his little hand in there, and um, take, the, take the babies or the eggs out. So, yep, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't recommend that. You can mount tree houses, uh, bird houses on a pole. You can hang them from a tree, whatever, wherever you're going to see it. And there's a variety of different sizes to attract different size birds. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no, they'll still eat those. Yeah, they'll, they'll eat shelled peanuts and in shell peanuts. They'll eat them all. Right, right. Debbie, Debbie is a good customer of ours, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yes. Do the birds ever use the nesting boxes in the winter for shelter? They will sometimes use them as a shelter. You're right. In the, it's a possibility, and there's, um, yeah, because in the extreme weather, they pro like, probably would. And we also, in the winter, we have roosting boxes, which is actually a bluebird house with the hole upside down. The hole's at the bottom, so the bird goes to the top where it's warmer, and they can fit a number of birds on there. There's perches in there and that. Mm -hmm. Yes? Right, right. And, you know, we, we pulled, and my husband said, that's it. You might, <laughs> you might want to try the no mess then, because it doesn't have the shell on it that would sprout. The other funny thing is, we had our trees trimmed, so the birdhouse that was hanging in the tree didn't have that branch that we could reach, so we put it on the shepherd's hook. Okay. So we would sit in the kitchen and watch this squirrel oh. try to get the bird. So my husband went out and got WD-40, and he oh. sprayed the whole thing. <laughs> so you see this squirrel get up. Vroom. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. There's also baffles you can put on your shepherd hook. There's baffles that will prevent the squirrel from going up there. The other question is, is it worthwhile throwing your bread out that you have left? Or no. Don't? No. So that all that does is fill the bird up and there's absolutely no nutrition to it. No. Yeah. I, I wouldn't recommend that because it just fills them up with zero, cal zero good calories. So. And they need the energy, especially come winter time. They need to have high fat, a high fat diet like suet, the black oil sunflower seeds, peanuts. So yeah. Yes. Um, I have something I like to say and see if anyone else has ever had this experience. Several years ago in February, you know, it's still winter and so forth. I heard all these robins, and I thought, my goodness, where are they coming from? I, I live on a cul-de-sac, there's trees and so forth. I looked out, and I had a friend came visiting the same time. There had to be 500 or more robins wow. in the buildings. Oh, my the, word. I called the Audubon Society because I thought, my word, what in the world? What would attract them? Are they going south? Have they come south? No, no. Robins, many they robins will... They, they'll stay here as long as they have food and water. So you must have had some... F was such a plot. Wow. It was just, they were on all the eaves, the roofs, the birds. Wow. <laughs> that's incredible. And they were all robins. Yeah, that's incredible. I've never heard of that many. But yeah, you must have, had, you must have fruit trees nearby you. Or, no, or open water somewhere, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. What a great story. Nobody else has ever had that? No. I've had the thing. I've heard of like grackles congregating like that, but not, not robins. And cedar waxwings, too. Yeah. Yeah. Debbie? Yeah, it's OK. No, no. Peanut butter's good. Peanut butter's really good. You can go out and just peer, smear peanut butter on the tree. That, I actually during the winter was putting it on, um, I know this sounds crazy, and I was like, you can't make me do this. Huh. But I was just putting peanut butter on the um, pine cones. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's a great thing. That's, putting, uh, some stuff yep, there. that's excellent. Um, that's like a little kid. That's, yeah, that's excellent. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, I had them too, I had them too. Well, the uh, other thing birds need in their, in their, if you want to bring them to your house is water. They need water all year long. They need water every day to survive. Clean, fresh water is extremely attractive to birds, even more so than a bird feeder. Um, if you do only one thing to attract the birds is give them, give them water and keep it fresh. Many birds will scout out a source of water for a drink and then stay for a bath. Um, a bathing keeps their feathers clean and waterproof, actually. And in the winter, we recommend um, a bird bath heater because there's most natural water is frozen at that point, and so they can't really find much water to drink or to keep their feathers clean. Clean feathers is a, um, a makes for a warmer bird as well. All right. I, I, in preparation for today's talk, I spent some time on the Cornell Department of Ornithology website and found a list of the top 20 feeder birds in the Great Lakes area. And I've got a prize for the person who can list the most number of birds. Now, I handed you guys, I think everybody should have a piece of paper with a pen on it. Does everybody have one of these? OK. All right. Oh, yeah. How many? Just one? OK. All right, when I say go, start listing as many birds as you think are on the top 20 feeder birds in our neighborhood. Do you need one? There you go. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right, we're, to, we're looking for the top 20 birds in our neighborhood. OK, anytime you're ready. Everybody all set? All right, I'm going to show you uh, pictures of the most common 20 birds. And um, I'm sorry I don't have a screen or anything. I'm not that techie yet. So um, the song sparrow is the number 20 bird in our area. He's, um, song sparrow sings constantly. He repeats this, his song every couple of minutes. And he's hard to just tell between your common house sparrow, too. So you can correct your list as we go along. Uh, the number 19 bird is the purple finch. He's very similar to the house finches. He's often confused with the house finches. And the males are not really purple, but more of a raspberry red. I'm sorry? No, no, this is not a common red pole. And common red poles are not really common in our neighborhood. We did have an influx of them two years ago in the winter. If we do get them, they'll be in the winter. Uh, the number 18 bird is the red-bellied woodpecker. He's coming. <laughs> um, the reason he's called the red-bellied, because he does have red on his head, there is a whole red-headed woodpecker whose head is entirely red. But the red-bellied, if you ever got a chance to see, actually does have a tiny little red spot that you can hardly see. No, a flicker is about the same size. The flicker is more yellow and speckled. But it, he, that is a woodpecker, though. Uh, the number 17 bird is the red-winged blackbird. This is the first sign of spring. When he's here, spring is here. Not robins. Robins, because robins can stay all year long. That's a, that's a myth from a long time ago. The number 16 bird is your common grackle, who can be very pesty in our yards. The name comes from the Latin graculus, meaning to cough, because of its raspy call. Just loaded with it. That's them. Yes. They're Yeah. That's either the common grackle or the European starling. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The next, number 15, is the American tree sparrow. 
This is only a winter bird feeder, a bird here in Michigan. He comes in the winter. And sparrows, there are so many different types of sparrows, it's super hard to identify them. And there are um, the house sparrow, for example, that's what you see mostly in your yard. He is not on that international migratory bill of 1918, along with the European starling. The reason is they're not native birds. Um, so they are not protected here in the United States. They were brought over to New York and Central Park in the 1920s from Europe because somebody had it in their mind that they wanted to bring all the birds um, that were in Europe here. So they, they are an invasive species, actually. <laughs> all right, number 14 on our list is the American crow. The American crow is one of the smartest birds. Actually, the smartest bird is the raven, but the crow is an extremely intelligent bird. He can mimic us. He can mimic other birds. He loves shiny objects. He will pick up shiny objects, take it to his nest. Is the mockingbird a crow? No. He's a mockingbird. Yeah, he's not one of the black. He's not one of the blackbirds. Yeah. Uh, it's a different bird. Yeah. We can look at the book if you want after. Uh, the number 13 most popular bird is the robin. The robin is our state bird, and he can stay here, like we were saying, all year round. He consumes large amount of worms every day. Large. I'm talking like five feet worth of worms. Yeah. So they, they work hard for their worms. Here he is, the house sparrow. Introduced from New York. Actually, I misspoke. It was 1850 he was introduced. Now, all we have, we feed the birds at, the, at, our, at our shop, and all we get are our house sparrows, but I have hundreds of them, and they brought their babies back, so I, I like them, and I don't mind. I have enough feeders at home that I don't mind the sparrows, but some people don't want to feed the sparrows. Number 11 is the hairy woodpecker. He's very similar to the downy woodpecker, but the hairy is huge, downy is dinky. The only way you can tell them apart is from their size and the, shape and the size of their beaks. They're very, very hard to tell apart. The hairy woodpecker has a longer bill and he's a little bit larger. And the females do not have the red on their head. I actually had um, hairy woodpecker babies uh, three years ago, three of them, and they were all partial albino. Yeah, they were, they were mostly white black here and there. I had a customer bring in a partially albino cardinal the other day. Yeah, you wouldn't realize how many that's a possibility, so yeah. Yeah, it is the starling that's on the side of the road, yeah. Um, and here he is, a picture of the starling. It's actually a very pretty bird when you see him glistening in the sun. He's got all these speckles on him. Once again, he was brought here. This was the thought. They wanted to bring all the birds that were in Shakespeare's play to the U.S. That, that's why they brought the, the sparrow and the starling. All right, the white-breasted nuthatch. He's number nine. He's referred to as the upside-down bird as it travels down the tree trunk looking for bugs rather than up like a woodpecker does. And he's here all year round, too. He's cute. Number eight, your house finch. You can see these around your feeder very often. They like to nest in your hanging baskets, and he's a very social bird. The female doesn't have much red on her at all, though. All the male birds are much prettier than the female birds, anyway. All right, the number seven is your northern cardinal. That's a picture of both the female and the male. And I've actually witnessed this, too. During courtship in the spring, the male will get a seed and feed it to the female while he's courting her. Should we ask our husbands to do that, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> and actually, the cardinal is named after the Catholic cardinal. Uh, the American goldfinch is your number six bird. This is also a very sociable bird. Many people call them wild canaries, especially if, if you're older, maybe. They still refer to them as wild canaries. The number five is the dinky downy woodpecker. 
He will often, if you put suet out, he will often be your first customer there. And like I said, you could just spread peanut butter on a tree and the woodpeckers will find it. Number four is your morning dove. I haven't seen many either. I've only seen maybe a couple at my feeders. Yeah. Right. This is a, he's a ground feeder. He likes to eat on the ground or if you have a large tray. And of course, his name comes from its mournful coo. And a few years back, we voted to protect them from hunting, if you remember that. The blue jay. He's another highly intelligent bird. And here he is picking a peanut out of the peanut wreath there. He is the alarm of the neighborhood. If you hear him squawking, that means there's a hawk or a predator in town. He, he lets everybody know, take, take cover. Um, like I said, he will cache his food and go find it. That was during that West Nile virus, I believe, the blackbirds and the blue jays, but um, what color are they? Blue and black? The blue jay is not blue. He's gray. It's the pigment, the, on the, when, the, when the light hits his feathers, it's, it's uh, the pigment. The, yep. And he, I have a super good picture of him at the store, and there's like five different colors of blue on him. He's just beautiful. The what? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, good. All right, the number two most popular bird here is the dark-eyed junco. And he's Michigan's most common winter resident. He does not stay here in the summer. He, he goes to northern Canada because he likes it cold. But in northern Canada, it gets extremely cold. So then he migrates to Michigan for our winters. When you see him, you know winter's coming. He's another ground-feeding bird. And the number one most popular bird here, and I forget who I was talking to, chickadee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's my, he's one of my favorites too. He is such a happy little, happy little bird. Um, he's the first to find a new feeder. He's also, you can, if you have the patience enough and you stand by your bird feeder with food in your hand, he will land on your hand eventually. Yeah, very friendly. So those are our most top 20. So, um, how, how, many, how many did you get right? Just show. How many? You got 20? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, anybody beat all 20? All right. No, I, I trust you. You win. <laughs> you win. You win. You don't trust yourself. I trust you. Oh my. All right, well that was fun. Um, I'd like to end today's talk with just this thought. Birds are a great, great opportunity to add beauty and life to your backyard, to, to your natural beauty of your garden. Um, and I think of it as, I think of flowers as God's way of smiling down. And I think that birds are God's way of reminding us that all creatures, great and small, can nurture us if we, if we let them. Um, with a few simple efforts and some planning, you can attract the energy, the activity, and songs of birds to your backyard throughout the year. Thank you very much.